Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Anarchy Comics number one through four. This was a great underground comic published by uh, Last Gasp, um, roughly from the late 70s to the late 80s. Four issues of comics about anarchy, but also uh, some of the comics are just about kind of lefty political ideas, but... Um, Mostly Anarchy, as the title implies. Some really great artists in here. Uh, it's edited by Jay Kinney. Uh, we've seen a bunch of Jay Kinney comics on this channel. Uh, cover Up, Low Down, because he's really into conspiracies. And we saw his, um, what was it called, Corporate Crime Comics. I'm pretty sure he was the editor of that. So he's just always a... Jay Kinney's a very uh, politically-minded underground cartoonist, even though he's always funny. Um... Because, you know, he was behind Young Lust. So he always, uh, most of his comics have a almost educational slant, but they're really funny and uh, use the comics form well. Let's uh, check out the first issue here. Cover by Jay Kinney. Nothing much. <laughs> this is kind of a little graphic. Using the old... Basically, the old stereotype of the anarchist was, a, you know, a bomb-throwing radical. And uh, so the Earth has a fuse on it. And all the continents are mislabeled. I guess showing that it doesn't really matter. No borders. So we have a little uh, introduction here. And it's, uh, it's supposedly an excerpt from a speech by Vladimir Lenin <laughs> at Disney World. September 16th, 1978. Very funny, weird stuff. We have uh, some cartoons here by Cy Seyfried. G. Seyfried. Um, I believe he he's European. Uh, is he Spanish or French? Sorry, I should have uh, looked that up. But really nice cartoony style. Popular misconception, misconception of typical anarchist and... You know, like I said, the bomb-throwing guy dressed in black. Actual anarchists in real life. And it's a little family, suburban family, but the kids are holding bombs still. So they, they don't take themselves too seriously in this comic. Uh, this first issue is 1978. And we start off with Jay Kinney's Too Real. And this is him using all this kind of a collage and text. A lot of clip art. And we just see this guy, uh, Joe. You know, he's living the typical corporate American life, but uh, he's disillusioned by it. And he becomes an anarchist. But it's mostly just a lot of jokes. It's all about anarchy. Pretty funny stuff. Here we have Spain Rodriguez. This uh, comic was originally published in 1976 in another magazine. It says, it looks like it says TRA. I don't know what that is. So, um, but this is a biography of Nestor Machno. And he was basically, you know, after the October Revolution of 1917 in Russia, he was basically, you know, anti Bolshevik. He was definitely, you know, wanting to take down the Tsar, was on the side of the Bolsheviks until the Bolsheviks took power and they wanted to crush all the other political parties, which they did. And so he fought the Bolsheviks, but, you know, he held out for a while, but eventually was his forces were taken down. It's kind of sad. He uh, fled to Paris where in 1935, he died of chronic alcoholism. So he was this great leader and, uh, you know, for freedom, but just ended up in a gutter, drinking some cheap French wine, probably. Really nice Spain art, though. This is one of the earlier uh, Spain political, uh, historical stories. Spain, you know, became known for that, doing these great little historical pieces. Oh, this is nice. We get Melinda Gib Gebby. Great underground cartoonist. 
the Leather Heart Gallery. And this is just this little character study of these women who are, they don't, even, they don't run around saying we're anarchists, but they basically are. That great face there. Just a weird, odd little story. Just, you know, like Belinda Gibby do. She's uh, definitely an interesting writer. Yes, these four women, and they're, uh, they're pulling some keeper. It's wonderful Melinda Gibby art. They're trying to do this jailbreak, and they realize all the women in prison are like, I don't want to go home. My old man will just beat me up like he used to anyway. She, I eat better here than I do at home, you know. Here we uh, get another Spain story, Blood in the Sky. And this is about the Spanish Civil War. Look at this great, this is like a Two-Fisted Tales worthy. This could have been an EC comic. And we see the anarchist forces. And the main character is this flyer. He was just a guy looking for a war. And so he joined the cause, the Republican cause in uh, Spain. It's, it's almost like an old war story, just lots of scenes of combat. But of course, uh, Spain puts lots of history in of the time. Look at that. Man, Harvey Kurtzman would have loved to have him draw for uh, one of his EC War comics. Oh, that's nice. Beautiful drawing in every panel. This was really interesting. I've read a little about the Spanish Civil War, mostly from George Orwell, Homage to Catalonia, his, his book. But um, if you know anything about that war, it's basically the the communists basically like killed all the competition who were fighting the fascist Franco. So, you know, the anarchists and the Democrats, democratic forces and the communists all teamed up to fight this fascist who uh, did a coup. But uh, I don't know if this is a, a true thing, but uh, Stalin gambled on making a deal with the West, even to the point of smothering a revolution in Spain. So he was wanting to toady up to the West, you know, to fight, because Hitler was there. He needed help to fight Hitler. That he kind of, like, said, hey, see, I, I helped keep this right-wing fascist in power just the way you like it. We got a little Gilbert Shelton Advanced International Motoring Tips one pager. And this is just suggesting that in the, that in the future there should be a, basically a offshoots of highways that are just anarchy. You can drive as fast as you want. You can just, anything goes. It's like Mad Max Fury Road. And you'll have the choice to do either one. Here we have uh, these uh, French artists. This is a reprint from Le Echo de Savanes, 1977. So this was a comic that appeared in that great French magazine, and uh, they reprinted it. It's by Epistolier and Volney. I guess those, those guys did a bunch of comics together. They were a team. And this is called Kronstadt. And there's another uh, story about the early uh, Russian Revolution.
And Kronstadt is another one who's basically like, hey, we fought against the Tsar, and now you guys are almost being as bad. So the, uh, he starts this revolt. And they're totally socialist. They just want to have a more democratic form of socialism. But of course, Lenin and Trotsky, those guys, you know, they wanted a pretty autocratic style of communism, which we saw what happened there. <laughs> it didn't end up well. Really, this guy's pretty good. Very, um, I guess pedestrian's the word, but really, I mean, really well done. He could, this guy could draw, but um, doesn't really exaggerate, you know, like a good cartoonist would. And of course, uh, the reason why this guy isn't in history books really, because they, they crushed his uh, revolt. They show a, a young Joe Stalin chuckling to himself at the end. So uh, this story is, uh, I can't remember, turn this for a second. I have to look in the credits, J.R. Oh, burn him, J.R. Burnham. I think he's an English artist. Very nice underground style. And there's just a warning to anarchists, you know. Like, uh, maybe you should uh, buy some guns because they'll be rounding us up soon. And it shows this kind of like 1984-like future. I like this image of... Uh, saying, let's all just march to the Pentagon and rip it onto its side. <laughs> At the bottom of the Pentagon, it's all the psychedelic cosmic eye stuff. This is a Cliff Harper, uh, English pol uh, political cartoonist. Well, I mean, he did lots of undergrounds in England and uh, Almost all of his comics are political. He's a very uh, radical guy, it sounds like. And this is just a story about the young anarchist movement in like 1838. And this woman uh, flew a black flag and a cap of liberty which I don't know necessarily what that is. And then the, you know, the cops come, the authorities, and she hides the flag and the cap of liberty. They find the black flag, but never the cap. And apparently she was hiding it where, where none would look for it. Sounds like she put it in her coochie or something. I think that's the joke. It's in this old English style of writing, so I'm not quite sure. Here we have some goofy little gags. I think these are all Jake Kinney. This one's trying to duplicate Dudensberry. See, this shows how Jay Kinney is a, uh, you know, it's, it's, he's very politically aware, but it's also, he just has goofy stuff in it. Like, out of nostril hairs, here, Floyd, try my brand. Hey, now. See, these work great. What kind are they? They're Aristotle Aristotelian brand nostril hairs. Oh, this is a great strip. Kinney and Mavridis. Oh, no, this is just Mavridis by himself. God, I love Paul Mavridis stuff. Some straight talk about anarchy. I love this logo here. We see Per Ubu. We see uh, 
Ignatz Mousen offers a pup. <laughs> Ignatz Mousen is throwing a brick at authority, the authority of Officer Pup. And this is just, you know, supposedly an explanation of anarchy, but it's really an excuse for Paul Mavridis to pack as much beautifully drawn gags as he can into this strip. Uh, I wonder if there's a Paul Mavridis collection out. I would love to see all of his stuff collected. It's just so brilliant. He puts so much thought and work into all of his comics, like crams it with all these like kind of smart jokes and clever, clever stuff. Yeah, this is kind of hard to summarize. Almost every panel is just a new idea. It's not much of a story. It's just all these little uh, tableaus and showing various uh, facets of anarchism and the way the authorities try to uh, crush it. Quit thinking like a TV set. You control the horizontal. You control the vertical. You can turn the damn thing off. Oh, nice. Looks like we have a, a walkout. The Anarchists have won. And this one person says, wait a second, tearing down civil civilization is terrific, but what will replace it? And the narrator, main character says, we'll build a new cooperative one with these, and it's Tinker Toys. A nice ad for uh, other political magazines. So they really kind of wanted this to be an educational thing. Here's a back cover by that guy, Jay Seafried. Uh, God, sorry, French or German? Exclusive on the spot sketch of mass anarchist demonstration in Tian Tiananmen Square in Peking. And we see that uh, bomb toting anarchist and all the communist Chinese have bombs themselves. I really like his cartooning. I gotta find more of this guy. Okay, let's look at number two. Another cover by Jay Kinney, which is just a photo, uh, a little collage. <laughs> we see these two punk rockers and they put George Washington's head on one of them. Not much of a cover. Great logo though. So this issue is 1979. I guess it sold pretty well, Anarchy Comics number one. There was like three printings of it. Here's a little co-introduction by this fate made up character. And uh, this is uh, just tells us all the, the contributors. Another cartoon by J.C. Freed. I guess he, he's almost like the mascot of the magazine. We see a story here about the Wobblies, a true story by Steve Stiles. The, you know, we've seen Steve Stiles many times in the underground videos we've done on here. Um, Usually did funny, goofy stuff. I've never seen him draw so straight. And uh, it's pretty nice. Well, I guess I have seen him once draw this straight. But this just looks like, uh, you know, EC comic stuff. So this guy's in the military. And he's got to talk to military intelligence. Apparently, because he was a member of the Wobblies. If you don't know the Wobblies are the IWW, and um, <clears throat> they're like the really radical form of uni unionism. Very hardcore lefty. And of course, uh, they were persecuted in America. The people did not like them. They didn't like unions in the first place. But IWW were definitely like socialist, you know, communist type union group. So the, we're basically just getting a nice little history of the Wobblies. Really well drawn. Steve Stiles really put uh, work into this. And we go back to the history.
and we see the persecution of the Wobblies by the government. Just the judges are handing out crazy sentences and they haven't really even broken any laws. They're just basically accusing them of being treasonous or un-American. And at the very end, the young uh, soldier, he, his accuser, he says, just between you and me, it's kind of bizarre to worry about an outfit that ran out of steam over 40 years ago. Because basically the IWW is like a handful of people left. Uh, I There's a small IWW meeting hall in Portland, Oregon here. I used to go once a week for my union meetings. And they don't seem like they're, they're pretty small. Yeah, WW. And they have been for a while. Just a little too radical for America. They really, they have a lot of great ideas, but uh, just America doesn't want that. <laughs> this is almost like a Believe It or Not page by Sharon Rudall. And uh, just showing throughout history all these interesting little facts about when societies were a little more had elements of anarchy. Or you could even just say like real democracy. Like in ancient Greece, uh, leadership was just assigned by a lottery for a limited period. So they were just like, yeah, we don't want this senator to be there forever. He's just, we just need someone to basically uh, organize the, the meeting and you're temporarily it. These, uh, this, the Potlatch Indians of the North Pacific, they would compete for prestige by burning their most valuable belongings. Like, top that, motherfucker. <laughs> I burned four canoes and five bear rugs. It's pretty interesting stuff. This is just hard to believe. According to the Mayan caste system, the big shots were responsible for the general well-being and subject to severe penalties for failure to deliver. So this slave was caught stealing grain. So they're like, we're going to execute the master who let him go hungry. <laughs> I can't even imagine that world. Here we have a nice, uh, it's called cult culture documents. It's all spelled weird. And this is great. It has the political bizarros. A little nod to Mort Weisinger era Superman comics. These guys are like bizarro. We big revolutionaries. And we also have the Picto family. And we see this typical American town, Dullsville, using these Picto people. And it's like typical bad American town, Dullsville. It's like, you know, pollution and <clears throat> just bad things are going down. It's a bad capitalist world. And the, the daughter becomes a, joins a cult. It's that bizarro cult. She even turns into this like, you know, looks different. <clears throat> and the parents uh, abduct her to deprogram her in a hotel room with this deprogrammer. And she actually converts them. So after the two weeks are over, they're like, they're bizarros now. And then meanwhile, the son, who's been home this whole time, locked in the house, he starts, he's bored, so he starts reading his favorite comic, Anarchy. Anarchy, yeah, I guess Anarchy, Problem Child. And it's this great parody of uh, Archie Comics, but he's an anarchist. Jughead is called Lewd Head. And then the comic just turns into the Archie parody. This is very typical, like, you know, Mad Magazine stuff. Archie's uh, and Archie's parents are just totally hippies. And he doesn't, he doesn't like it. He's a young punk. I like this how Veronica Lodge 
I can't remember her name in this, but you know, in the Archie comics, he's super rich. So in here, he acts like a super rich person. Like he has this party and he's talking about like, oh yeah, we, uh, thanks to my money, we toppled that uh, democratic government in South America, installed our own puppet fascist. And then the Red Brigade shows up, starts shooting everybody. So the Bizarros start this revolution. The workers take control of the factory. The son finally breaks out of the house and he goes down to the factory, starts trashing police cars and stuff. And uh, this guy shows up, seems pretty omniscient. He's like, drop your Picto character armor and go for the gusto. Basically be who you want to be. And all these characters that look like the Bizarros just have all these, like, it's like little Ultra Boy, Ultra Man. One of those uh, Walter Keen painting hippie type people. A talking, a, a walking dog. And then they all uh, have a nice marshmallow roast over a burning police car. And we see all these cameos. Now that everyone's taken on the persona they want, we see a, a Tin Tin looking guy. We see a Picasso abstraction face. There's Trash Man hiding out in the background, which is apropos. And it's Tony Target by Mark ba Bear. It's kind of weird because Mark Bear, you know, was pretty uh, just starting out then. It's a nice homage. Yeah, Jake Kinney and Paul Mavridis, whenever those guys collaborate, it is just so much, every page has got basically a story's worth of ideas in it. I mean, most artists would take this one page and could convert this into a, like a nice six page short story, but they just cram it, it's so good. Next we have uh, English artist Cliff Harper again, illustrating uh, Brecht's uh, The Black Freighter. I think this is from the Three Penny Opera. Or maybe it's a separate thing. But this is, uh, you know, it's in verse form. And it's basically the fantasy of this, like, lowly scrub woman who has all these rich guys at the hotel where she works gawking at her and whatever, just being shitty to her. So it's almost her fantasy that one day this black freighter will show up in the harbor and just kill everyone, blow up the whole city. And the one building that would be left standing is her hotel where she works. Because they know her. They're like, they're like, okay, we killed everyone. Come on to the Black Freighter with the black flag as the as their flag. But uh, the way Cliff Harper draws it. We realize that, uh, nah, this is just a sad fantasy she has. A bitter fantasy every day while she's scrubbing the floor. She's like, ah, that would be great. Because in the her fantasy, she kills all these rich fat cats from the hotel. Here we have another nice Spain uh, historical biography, Derudi. And uh, this is during the Spanish Civil War once again. Really nice Spain art. As usual, I mean, that guy usually uh, is pretty fastidious. He doesn't dick around. And uh, so Derudi uh, basically was, you know, socialist or anarchist. I think those words were almost interchangeable back then. And he was like taken out, like these archbishops and stuff. Cause you know, the church was totally on the side of fascism. So these uh, revolutionaries did not like the church.
And once again, you know, of course, the, the reaction by the authorities, by the fascist powers, is even worse than what anything Derudi ever did. Derudi takes a little trip to South America to rob some banks to get money for the cause. Here's a little uh, crossover, like in a Marvel comic. Uh, he, me he meets great Ukrainian anarchist Nestor Makhno, who we saw in the first issue. It even has the Sea Anarchy comics number one, just like uh, Stan Lee would do. So when uh, Franco seizes power, uh, Derudi, you know, fights him, of course. And they did pretty well against the fascists for a while, but, uh, you know, we know what happened. <laughs> they didn't win. And Derudi, like, pretty young, in 36, was shot in the chest and killed. Oh, man, I love this time period of Spain. Spain's artwork in, like, the late 70s. It's perfect. Romantic Anarchy featuring Sally Saliva. Supreme Sister from the Syndicate. This is a Peter Pontiac comic. Uh, great Dutch artist, Peter Pontiac. Very Robert Williams-y looking, but also definitely his own style. This guy's an amazing cartoonist. He puts in the work, that's for sure. And this is uh, kind of just about him. He's late He's late turning in the last two pages of this comic to Jay Kinney for Anarchy. And he's writing about it. But then he starts spouting off about all these, like, his beliefs, basically. Radical Reflections. This is supposedly a PBS show. And we just see this various viewpoints is arguing about class and anarchy and stuff like that. Here we have another uh, French comic script by Epistolier, art by M. Troublin. Oh, so this is a different artist than the other collaboration. This is also from Le Echo de Savannes. The Yippies at the Exchange. In 1968, a bunch of Yippies went to the Wall Street Stock Exchange and kind of got in. And they threw money down into the that main pit where the guys trade stocks and it causes total chaos. And then they had a pile of money and they lit it on fire. And that was just sacrilege. They were just like, oh my God, you can't do that. And because of this, the, uh, the stock exchange uh, installed bulletproof glass and metal grills around the visitor's galley. It used to be way more open. Really nice art from this guy. Very stylized. I like it. I like the shadows in that panel. It almost looks like Frank Miller. Oh, we get another Melinda Gibby. Quotes from 1910, Red Emma. So basically it's uh, Melinda Gibby just illustrating all these uh, quotes from Emma Goldman, the famous uh, anarchist. And I guess feminist. Even though strangely enough, did you know Emma Goldman was against suffrage for women? <laughs> she was always speaking out like women shouldn't have the vote, even though she was a total feminist. It's very strange. I've read a lot of a bunch of stuff about her, and nobody really quite explains it well enough to my liking. There's a quote in here where she says why, but it seems ridiculous. It's like, well, why not have the vote too? The vote won't give you freedom necessarily, but it's a good thing to have just to have equality. So these are some great quotes from Emma Goldman about the institution of marriage and uh, how stifling it is to women. 
These the lettering in this is crazy because these pages a title. Look at this insane lettering. It's hard to read. Read wealth consists in things of utility and beauty. This page is nuts. Just using so many different styles. It's almost like four artists are jamming on this page. And here's the page, I believe, about suffrage. Yeah. I love this little montage here showing all the sex roles reversed. Like, this guy's pregnant. I don't know what the hell that's supposed to be. Just this demon succubus. Amazing. Oh, man. I love me some Melinda Gibby. And that's great, too. Just this. I'm not quite sure what's going on in this comic. It's Melinda Gibby. She, uh, she has an interior world, which I'll never quite understand. But I, I love visiting. The bizarre yet familiar world of commodity fetishism. Jay Kinney. Two-way wrist TV from Dick Tracy. Just talking about how people, all these newfangled inventions, people are just so, like, fetishize them. I guess the Betamax video recorder was just coming out then. <laughs> I love this. Paul Mavridis. I guess this was, this was available as a poster. It's just this uh, portrait of Mao Zedong. <laughs> but, like, Walter Keaton style. That's cute. That's funny. Okay, Anarchy number three. Beautiful cover by Peter Pontiac. I love this cover. This is just... Oh, man. You just stare at this for ten minutes and just keep seeing all this little detail. I love the sleeping demon up here. But just the dynamics of this guy throwing the brick. It's just really just great cartooning. The sense of movement is... Just palpable, really nice. Colors are great. I gotta get me some more Peter Pontiac. I've, I have him in a few anthologies, but that's about it. I definitely want more. Here we have a supposedly an introduction by Dr. Adam Weishaupt, the famous Illuminati figure. And this is 1981. So uh, it's a few years late, uh, after number two. Basically tells us a lot of the uh, contributors, once again, but in this funny framework. This faux political manifesto type thing. Start off with a beautiful Paul Mavridis a drawn story. J. Kinney script, No Exit. And this is uh, kind of a, about punk rock. We see this punk rocker, Jean-Paul Sartre Jr., And he's a total stereotypical, like, like the TV version of punk. Like he'd be on Quincy, an episode of Quincy or Chips or something. Just amazing mixed media here. I don't know if that's a photo we touched or pretty amazing. And just, you know, as these guys always do, they're just crammed with gags and plot points and this guy's shooting glue into his arm. Wood glue. So we see his punk band. And he's basically, the lyrics of a song are like, kill your mom, kill your pa, kill the rent -a cop right now. And the rent -a cop in the crowd, the security guy, they literally, they just follow his orders blindly. Kill the virgin girl next door. And there's a girl there who looks all straight. They kill her. And then he says, kill yourselves or kill me. <laughs> so they kill him or they try to, they almost do. But just very fun panels of carnage. I know I compare a lot of underground cartoons to Bill Elder, but they were all inspired by Mad. And this has that just manic fun of a good Bill Elder page. So they take the, uh, John Paul to the hospital 
And there's not, he's too far gone, so they just throw him in a cryogenic tub. And he wakes up 3,000 years later, and anarchy has prevailed. The world is this beautiful paradise where anarchy is the law of the land, if you will, not to use a mixed metaphor. But um, everything's peaceful and great, and this punk record doesn't like it. He's just like, ah, these guys are all a bunch of hippies. But Paul Mavridis is so good at drawing this sci-fi stuff. And he's not fitting in it at all. He's antisocial. Because, you know, anarchy only works if people are well-adjusted. If, uh, if everyone's a psychotic, you know, narcissist, they're just going to take advantage of the fact that there's no laws. But these people are all pretty emotionally mature, and they realize this guy's not. In fact, he's pretty horrible. So they eventually just say, you know, we don't often do this, but we're sending this guy back in time. And they're like, I hope we uh, ironed out the kinks from last time. And I guess they didn't because they send him back to 1967. Hate Ashbury. And we see this total crumb-like homage of all these hippies. And he's just like, ah, this is hell. For him, that's hell. I like this panel here. This kind of reminds me of Ditko. Later Ditko, some weird effect he would do. Oh, that's a great one. Here we have the French guy Epistolier again with M. Troublin again. Anarchy in the Alsace. The revolt of the Rusthouds. I know I'm pronouncing that terribly, guys. Sorry, I don't know any better. This is a reprint again from another French comic magazine. And this is a story about the um, the Rustouts. They were these peasants who basically finally got fed up. This is like the 1500s. And they started revolting and like made an army. And we're going from town to town. We're ransacking them. It's just weird that this didn't happen more often in the Middle Ages. I mean, because th these people's lives were just like slavery. They're just miserable. And uh, the rich guys had all the power and they had nothing. And they had so many more people than the rich people did. So it's just weird this didn't happen more often, and I wish it did. But of course, like all these things, the they're squabbling within the peasant army. The more bourgeois elements of it try to take over, and they don't like that. So, you know. So the king, of, of course, with the... With the help of the church, they uh, they kill, exterminate all these peasants. It sounds like tens of thousands of them were killed. Oh, I'm sorry, hundreds of thousands. It's This is interesting. They go to Martin Luther. They think he's going to be on their side. And he's like, no. You guys got to bow down to the Lord's. The Lord's receive their authority from God. I also would have hoped that uh, more of the peasants back then would have been atheists because <laughs> the church was so corrupt. I'm amazed they put up with it for so long. Here we have this uh, comic called uh, Wildcat. I believe this is uh, reprinted uh, from an English um, uh, lefty magazine. And maybe you do this just for for anarchy comics. I don't know. But it does say Wildcat appears in every issue of Freedom from London. And this is just a total gag comic. Wildcat is this crazy anarchist type. Look, he's got his bomb. The Act of Creation According to Bakunin and Albor. Bakunin is the famous, uh, you know, political guy. I, I guess he was an anarchist, yeah. I, I don't I don't know my history that well. He was either like socialist or anarchist. And it's uh, drawn by Albo Helm. He's just kind of drawing a bunch of quotes from Bakudin. But like in a very humorous way. You know, not just doing it literally. Adding all these little side gags and stuff. It's a retelling of the Adam and Eve myth. But of course, 
God is the is a jerk in this. God's the the enemy, the villain. And when they disobey him, Adam and Eve, by eating the apple, he punishes them with government. That's his way to punish them. Is to have governments created. What is government? This is a, another one by uh, Clifford Harper, the English cartoon, political cartoonist. And by political, polit sorry, I gotta, I can't talk today. By political cartoonist, I don't mean he does the little spot panels for newspapers. All of his c comics are very political. This one is kind of a, I don't know, almost like a poem. Kind of weird and odd. Nice drawing. But uh, here's an example. Uh, whoever lays their hands on me is a usurper and a tyrant. I, I declare them to be my enemy. Government is slavery. Its laws are cobwebs for the rich and chains of steels for the poor. So it just goes on and on like this. But it's kind of weird how it just keeps repeating this. What is government? Even every panel, what is government? What is government? It's a little, at least graphically, visually not appealing. It gave it this like, kind of, made the comic more boring than it is. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. The, the words are all by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. In 1848, he wrote these in 1848 in Paris. So he was like an early anarchist, apparently. Wasn't a fan of government, that's for sure. We have another Radical Reflections, the fake PBS show by Jay Kinney. More people just uh, in a humorous way talking uh, about class and sex and politics. Here we got Roman Spring, another great uh, story by Spain. Well, he illustrates it. The story is by Adam Cornford and Jay Kinney. 1977, uh, there's all this unrest in the universities of uh, Italy. This uh, guy, Salvatore, is visiting his daughter, Sylvia. And they don't really agree politically. And so the head of his union is coming to speak at her university tomorrow. And he's like, yeah, he'll talk some sense into you. But uh, when he gets there, the students are like heckling him, basically. So S Sylvia's dad, all these like, you know, hardcore union guys, they're basically communists. They, uh, Start busting these hippie, you know, these young students' heads. And Sylvia's like, please, that guy's my friend. And so they have a falling out. So I guess the struggle intensifies over the next few months. And we see this uh, a giant uh, demonstration outside the, the courthouse to free, they want to free the Red Brigade. It's a, there's a trial of these Red Brigade leaders. Turns into this massive street brawl. And Sylvia's getting manhandled by this cop. And all of a sudden her father shows up. He conks him on the head. And he's basically like, yeah, you know, I realize that uh, these communist guys are not so great. I'm on your side. And he invites all these young radicals to his house for dinner. So it's a happy ending. I really like this art once again. I know I keep saying that. Here's a young Steve Laffler doing the Naked Avenger. And like most Steve Laffler comics is, I don't know, <laughs> not a big fan of that guy. But this is like a, I kind of like the cartooning in this way more than I usually do, his cartooning. It's just a little one-page gag. He, he, <coughs> sorry about that. Here we have Gerd Seafried again. He's the guy who draws that little bomb toting mascot walkie-talkie and this is just a total pantomime silly gag not really that political just uh for yucks also we got gary panner 1981 this is pretty early 
And this is a, this is almost like a Mutt and Jeff comic. These two characters, Pure Rocks, and I can't, I can't remember the other guy's name. And it's just nuts. They're just, it is so zany. And it just has all these weird black lines everywhere. So strange. I actually didn't find it that uh, visually appealing. It was almost annoying at a certain point. It was like, oh man, get these lines out of here. But I like Gary Panting's, uh, sorry, Gary Panter's crazy cartooning. These guys are basically just running around blowing up buildings. It's very silly. It's not that heavy. It's just uh, almost like an old gag strip. Uh, we got more Melinda Gebby. Beautiful stuff. Benjamin Perre, po Poet as Revolutionary. And these are all... Uh... Oh, wait a second. Oh, I'm totally wrong. I thought this was Melinda Gebby. Oh, it is. I'm sorry. But it's Adam Comfort. I assume writing it, maybe? This has some amazing Gebby artwork here. Yeah, this is just like the surrealist poet. I'm sorry. Yeah. And she's illustrating some of his writings. And look at this. Just insanity. This is just amazing surreal art. The poetry is very surreal as well, and it's pretty well illustrates the feeling of the of the words. I'm gonna assume that's maybe the poet, because that's a uh, drawn very straight. This is some amazing stuff. Of course, you know it's just it's all surreal. I don't really quite understand it. I'm Mr. Caveman over here. The abstract stuff loses me, but it's fun to read and just bizarre. Oh, it continues here. Here we have a nice long story by Sharon Rudall, The Treasure of Cabo Santiago. And we see this kind of well-off Mexican people, and they're talking about how it used to be this little town where now everything's all slick and fancy and all these tourists come. But it used to be a very small, poor village. And when he was a little boy, you know, he grew up there. This this guy who's now rich. And just talks about his father. And his father was just like, you know, as the more tourists came and more business came, the fishing got worse. There was pollution. So it was harder to make ends meet. So people would just have to get jobs in the tourist industry, you know, being grunt workers for rich tourists. And he won't do it. His wife is pleading with him. She's like, we got a third child on the way. Just get a job at a fucking hotel or something. He's like, I'm never going to serve another man. You know, be, be a slave. But he finally does. But they, uh, Luckily, they struck strike oil on his little patch of land. And uh, apparently, though, strangely enough, that doesn't make him rich. Because the government had subsoil mineral rights. So it was the government's anyway. But he opened the store because all the... The oil industry needed uh, little parts and stuff and became rich. Here we have a crazy Greg Iron strip. I've never seen him draw in this style. It's a very, I, I want to say viscous. It almost looks like everything's just like liquidy and flowing and weird. But I mean, when you look at the faces, it's definitely Greg Irons, especially because he has that baboon character which is kind of Greg Iron's alter ego. And this is very just, uh, not much of a story. Just a random little uh, scenes and things showing society's just getting really bad. Man, some really good stuff though. I 
love this crazy last page. It's almost like Greg Irons, he was one of the few underground guys who was like, oh, I get this punk thing. This kind of nasty attitude of the punks I've always had. Because this looks like punk art, punk rock art. Here we have these little gag strips by Dale Lester. I'm sorry, Dave Lester. Kind of about, not about anarchy really, more about um, relationships between uh, genders, between men and women. Marion Ludbrook does these poorly drawn gags. And we have a, a little half page Jake Kinney gag strip, New Age Politics. She's in a color theory and she thinks that the anarchists should change their check, their, sorry, their flag from black. Pest Control by Matt Fiesel of a uh, cynical man theme. And this is before he started drawing stick figures when he was drawing straight. He's pretty good. It's, uh, if you just saw his cynical man comic, you'd be like, yeah, oh, look at this guy, he can't draw. He draws like a four year old. But that was just the little stick man style he wanted to do. He has decent straight cartooning. It's kind of this crazy story where the cockroaches and ants on this guy's property are just getting out of hand. They're like mutating and taking over. So he trains the ants to attack the roaches. Through all this positive reinforcement, he gives the ants you know, like food and stuff and makes them, they start obeying him. I like this, the roaches take the kitten hostage <laughs> and when the ants show up, the kitten's all tied up. He's bound and gagged. So he has to, work, he leaves the house for a second because the wife's going to leave. She's like, you're crazy, this is nuts. And while he's gone for just a few minutes, the ants and the roaches get together and they're like, hey, we're, we should be on the same side. Fuck this guy. And they chase him out of the house. The ants teach the cockroaches co cooperation. The cockroaches teach the ants to think for themselves. Here we have a little bulletin board with some information about other anarchist publications, comics for sale. And a back cover by Pepe Moreno who we've seen many times in doing science fiction comic strips in Epic Illustrated. But I guess uh, he has this uh, political pit-up. Fast-acting relief from annoying pests. New, improved anarchy spray. And, uh, you know, see these mosquitoes, communism, America. Okay, anarchy number four, the last issue. This was published way after number three. This was like 1987, I believe. Beautiful poem of Rita's cover here. I love it, he uses the comic dots, like the zipper tone. It gives it this amazing misty feeling like this, a really cool effect, which you know this is before computer imagery and stuff. You could probably do this in a second now. It probably took him hours to get that effect, laying down screens and su such. I love that one. I love how he's a, like this, he's a caveman and he's got a golf club and a telephone receiver as a, as little weapons. All his computers are in the rubble. This guy's got a hammer. De-evolution. Once again, we have another, uh, you know, the contributors, but it's this, uh, supposed legal document about the conspiracy, you know, the man um, pressing charges against the Anarchy Comics Collective. We have another great Kenny and Mavridis collaboration, Armageddon Addy here. And uh, I guess uh, there's a survivalist dude, Bud. And one day it happens, nuclear war. And all these cities go up. But then we find out it was just a simulator. It was just a simulation exercise. So the world hasn't been blown up. 
We see this one guy who works there at uh, you know the military. His name is Dritz. He uh, tests the space case defense system. And then one day, he's driving home and all these giant appliances are being catapulted onto the freeway. And it's the, it's, it's a work, I'm sorry, it's a terrorist act of the Breatharian Liberation Front. They're these weirdos who believe that food is evil, you shouldn't eat food, and you should just have, you know, breath. I don't know how they survive. I'm sure they cheat a lot. We see the Antichrist, we see Jesus has returned. It's uh, the end times. So that we go back to Bud sitting in his bunker and his TV goes out. He's like, ah, some idiot must have uh, crashed my antenna, my satellite dish. And it's um, Dritz. Because he had a giant refrigerator on his car hood. We see Anarchy again. Mohawk to Archie. And their punk band is playing and... <laughs> The, the cacophony of their practice is so whatever that uh, Bud thinks it's the air raid siren. And he grabs Dritz and is like, come on, get into my shelter. It's our last chance. God, Bud is just a master of cartooning. This is so fun. He's this great lettering, this great sound effects. You just want to keep reading, you know. It's, it's really just knows storytelling and everything. So these guys are down there for 10 years in the bunker. And finally, after 10 years, it uh, automatically opens and they go out into the world. And it looks like the Protharians have taken over. The fast food chain there is called Stop and Sniff. And they just have little bags of smells. So you can get like Banana Puff, Rocky Road. So there's nothing to eat. You just smell stuff. They offer some granola to these people, the guys from the bunker, Dritz does, and they're like, ah, get the police. These guys have food. That's against the law. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, the Antichrist and Jesus show up, and I guess they've teamed up and are going on a crime spree with Mary Magdalene, who's drawn just like Betty Page. And then all of a sudden the rapture happens. <laughs> and uh, Bud, Bud says, he says like, wait, aren't you guys Christians? How come you're not getting raptured? And Jesus is like, hell no, we're Jewish. Dritz is like, I'm a Scientologist myself. So this plague of locusts comes down these uh, communist breatharians, you know, had them surrounded. Oh, I'm sorry. These guys f overthrew the breatharians. They're all skinny because everyone, nobody's been eaten. And then the plague of locusts attacks them. And it just gets nuttier and nuttier. And then Jesus and the Antichrist start fighting. And then the White Brotherhood of Wotan shows up and they unleash the Serpent of Midgard. And then Shiva shows up. And then this UFO shows up. Uh, Randar from Galactic Command says, here, I've come to save you. Come aboard. And then Shiva smushes it with her foot. And then there's this cosmic battle between, you know, Nordic gods and Hindu gods. Look at this great panel. This is like, should be in a Marvel comic. That is fun shit. So these guys are like, fuck all this shit. We're getting back to our bunker. <laughs> they bring a cow down so they have milk for their granola. What a nutty story, man. That is like... See what I'm talking about as far as uh, packing ideas into a comic? I mean, yeah, just the last two pages could be a 32-page comic. The whole 
Shiva showing up and the Serpent of Midgard. It's just chock full of fun, their stuff. Here we have another uh, Clifford Harper story. And I guess the in 1982, some teenager hurled petrol bombs into the local police station in a London suburb. And this just kind of illustrates it in this really nice woodcut style. It looks like those, uh, you know, Franz Maserol, those guys from the 20s and 30s. Very nice graphics. I like this. A little strip by Norman Dog. Norman Dog, uh, God, he was in so many anthologies in the mid to late 80s, and then I don't know what happened to him. I think he also had a syndicated comic strip in altern alternate, sorry, alternative weeklies. This is Choose Your Own Cartoon, You Rule the World. And it's one of those ones where at the end of every panel, it says, if yes, panel four, if no, panel five. It's not that great, to be honest, <laughs> but uh, it's kind of fun. Norman Dog had this art style that would almost like almost look like clip art, but it wasn't. He just drew in a very this doesn't even look like his normal stuff. His normal stuff was more clip arty looking. 1871 by Spain Rodriguez, once again. Another Hector sorry, historical anecdote. This is about the the French uh, German War, 1871. And uh, the French lose. Two of these soldiers, they, uh, they're banning, they abandon their posts. They're like, everyone else has fled. We're getting out of here. We got to retreat. And their, their uh, commanding officer like, hits him with the flat of his sword. And so he slugs him. He's like, fuck you. You know, the, the battle's over. They go back to Paris. And Paris, I guess, is still pretty okay. They have a gay old time there. But then the Prussians surround the city. It doesn't look good. And uh, the city's up under siege, so everyone's running out of food. So the Prussian army walks through the streets, victorious. They've taken over. But then it's the, from this, the Paris Commune starts. And so a lot of factory owners just fled Paris. So the workers just took over the factories. But I guess they weren't politically savvy enough. They couldn't uh, retain the advances they made. And of course, um, eventually the authorities crush it, like they always do. Nice stuff. And of course the authorities like massacre all the the anarchists slash communists. Uh, I love I love that this every issue has got Melinda Gibby in it. Public enemy This is a very odd little story, almost like a prose poem. It's like, I love how every story, every panel, Melinda Gibby's got a different style going on. So many different styles in this comic alone. This is about a, a comic store where they keep getting busted which I don't know if Melinda Gibby was living in England at this point, but that was a big thing in the 80s where like the England uh, 
English authorities would seize packages of comics, you know, that were kind of X-rated underground comics. And uh, it happened all the time. So this is almost like a poetic uh, metaphor for, about that. Melinda Gibby actually had to go through this. Um, she she was charged with obscenity, had to go before a judge. Oh, so this must have been, this is a veiled uh, account of that, I believe. I don't know why I didn't pick that up in the first place. Her book was taken off the racks, all copies burnt to grit. Here's another Norman dog strip. Mr. Helpful. This guy's uh, just thinking to himself, I've got to think about those less fortunate than myself. But of course, he just gets distracted by eating and whatever. He doesn't live up to his promise. Here we have a little short story by S. Zorka. Never heard that name before. Pretty funny uh, little story. And here's R. Diggs showing these, uh, all the corporations are dinosaurs and they feed on those who are smaller, but then all of a sudden there's this new dinosaur, the Arbitragodon, Arbitragodon, and it feeds on bigger creatures. It's basically, um, it's that whole junk bond thing of the eighties, like that movie Wall Street. So, uh. This little guy's gobbling up all the bigger corporations, taking them over. Really great cartooning in this. I like our digs. Very classic style. Anarchy equals panarchy. Oh, this is always a treat getting Hal S. Robbins. I'm sorry, Harry S. Robbins to do a strip. God, this guy puts so much beautiful detail in every panel. He did a lot of subgenius artwork, did a handful of undergrounds. Not enough. I wish he did more underground comics because he's really good at it. And this is just, once again, every panel is packed with jokes and amazing artistic detail. Here we see that little mom-toting mascot. And he's basically just uh, defining anarchy. But he's saying in a way it's more like panarchy. Because everyone in this world, in world, world by anarchy, once again, I mixed the metaphor, they'll be their own sovereign nation. So these people are introducing themselves and are like, any friend of the socialist worker state of Bud Peters is a friend of mine. Let me introduce you to the Grand Principality of Peggy Trockman. And he's just showing off this ideal anarchist world. But, oh, there's so much of stuff in here. This is another one. You could spend just 10 minutes looking at these two pages. And here's a total Bill Elder. Um, he's in a museum, and it says chaos, trying to um, illustrate anarchy, you know, some of the definitions of anarchy. And I think why this Elder signature is there. I think this was a mad parody of abstract art that Elder did. And it even shows that old woman saying, Vili, <laughs> like in all the old mad comics. It's so weird. Yeah, this is, I'm trying to look at all these little things. Here we have the, he's talking about the fat cats and one of them is Garfield. And here's Pluto the dog. But of course, the whole time he's talking about this beautiful anarchy world, he, uh, <clears throat> he's he been surveilled by all these DEA, FBI, IRS. And they come to his door and he, he tries to fight him off with his frying pan. But of course, uh, he's overpowered. He can't win against that shit. 
Nice stuff. Here we have a one-pager by Byron Werner. See this little baby in a weird landscape. These aliens said, hey, we want to share our technology with you. And the baby says, the civilization of this planet is still too primitive to use the knowledge wisely. Please return at a later date. And they fly off. Another nice Kenny and Mavrides one-page cover-up lowdown. And uh, we see these, like, Contra-type soldiers killing peasants in Latin America. And they're like, our guns are jamming. Go get some more. And look, it's Fat Freddy. It looks just like Fat Freddy. And he goes down to the gun mart. And instead of buying guns, he got seduced into buying these missiles because they were on sale. And this guy says, ay, 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 that was our CIA funding for the whole week. And here we have a back cover by Paul Mavrides of uh, Greetings from Hiroshima, Japan. U.S. Air Force is credited with the photography. That's insane. <laughs> wow. So there we go, guys. I know it took a long time, but these comics are crammed with information and cool comics and everything but i hope you enjoyed them i really recommend these are some of my favorite undergrounds because sometimes the undergrounds are just a little too silly and goofy and these are just like really at least a lot of thought went into them for the most part and one of my favorite runs uh, of an underground one through four anarchy comics hope you can find them um the first one's easier to find it had three printings the other ones just had one so good luck finding those, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.